The last two years of bungee shenanigans have been a piss storm of corporate blunders. I think I've finally seen enough dumpster fires that I'd like to talk about it. Stop me if you've heard this story. Bungie releases Witch Queen in February 2022. Absolute banger. All time highs for player population. Everyone's rock hard, including your mum. Five months later, Sony acquires Bungie for 3.7 billion, according to a Sony earnings report. Seven months later, they release Lightfall. To brief, all time high player population, but this time it sucks. There's massive player drop off and within months, Destiny hits all time low population numbers. Oh, it's a flaming hot crisis. What's interesting about Lightfall is that compared to Witch Queen, I would argue the total level of polish was about the same. The total volume of content was about the same. Neomuna was almost the same quality as Savathun's Throne World, if a bit sparse. Lightfall's six-man match-made activity Terminal Overload was about the same as Wellspring. The new big boy enemies were about the same with Lucent Brood versus Tormentors. The gameplay action of the campaign was about the same, as long as you weren't trying to actually use Strand. Um, but one of the main selling points of the entire expansion. If you cared about that, then it was Cock and Ball Torture sponsored by Bungie Incorporated. The strand rollout was so bad, they immediately unlocked the rest of the aspects and fragments that were supposed to be time-gated so people would like it more. And the story was so effing bad, it gives me diarrhea to this day, dude. Here's the thing. I actually have a lot of compassion for artists trying to make stuff. It's so unbelievably difficult to make something good. That's why most movies are bad. Most TV shows are bad. Most YouTube videos are bad. My channel not withstanding. Most music is bad and so on. So if you tell a 9 out of 10 story with Witch Queen, and then those same people tell a 7 out of 10 story with Lightfall, that's fine. I'm I'm right there with you. I think that's an acceptable range, given your demonstrated level of talent. The problem is, it wasn't a 7 out of 10 story with Lightfall, was it? It's not even a 5 out of 10. I'm at a 3 to 4 out of 10, personally. All the bones for something really interesting were there. A secret city, mystical security guards, Callus at peak evil. The supervillain is attacking. The veil, um, is there and it's pink. But they fumbled every plot point as hard as they possibly could. A story this bad isn't just an oopsie. It's either deep-rooted incompetence or deep-rooted arrogance. And speaking of, back to the timeline. So eight months after Lightfall, Bungie has a meeting and the executives tell employees that annual revenue is 45% below projections. And 45 is too much. The CEO says it's due to weak player retention. Hmm, I wonder why players have dropped off. I can't think of anything. He tells staff they're cutting costs like travel and implementing salary and hiring freezes. And two weeks later, they lay off 8% of the staff, at least 100 out of a 1,200 person company. Employees said they'd flagged issues related to Destiny subpar performance with Bungie leadership months before the layoffs, begging for the chance to win players back. Former community manager DMG posted a scathing tweet thread about the people in charge. Quote, it is frustrating, infuriating even, to continue seeing people who strap in to do good work, losing their financial security due to poor management. Continued echoes of poor decisions made that feel of Avoidable. So it seems like upper management was denying employees any chance at redemption with poor decision making, despite warnings from employees. Execs said other levers were looked at to avoid layoffs, but when employees asked if one lever was executive compensation, they were told no. That would not happen at the company. Did you know that over 1 billion percent of women have fallen in love with a man who's well groomed? Did you know that giraffes are a real animal? Hey, look at my neck. The tightest, closest shave you've ever seen brought to you by Manscaped. Specifically, this handyman approximately 20 minutes before I hit record. Imagine the most precise machine in the world gave birth to a needle, and then that needle married a laser, and together they found the cure for cancer, and that cure designed a product, and that product is this handyman. I personally use it several times a week to shave my neck and communicate directly with the god of the universe. My second favorite product of all time from them is the beard trimmer. This device has every beard length in one dial. There's no other parts, you just twist. It's Indiana Jones on the dial of destiny out here, except instead of time travel, you effing, it's precision hair. I use two millimeters for my upper cheek, five millimeters for my lower cheek and six millimeters for my butt cheek just as God intended. If you want to be slightly more attractive than you are now and start trimming all your bits with Manscaped. Use my promo code Jez for 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com. They paid me to say this but I use the products literally all the time. Amen. Okay back to executive compensation and in Paul Tassie's article where he talked about this by the way all the articles I used as sources for this video are linked in the description. It was actually an update that reads as follows. Quote post publication Bungie responded saying that CEO Pete Parsons and some other executives previously forfeited annual bonuses before the layoffs. It's staff were not informed this happened until yesterday. The sum total of the bonuses given up is not clear. Hmm. So they announce missed projections and two weeks later fire 8% of staff on a Monday. Then on Thursday, they tell everyone in a town hall, oh yeah, management totally already forfeited some annual bonuses. But this is only made public 
after all the negative press has come out. What happened to the previous statement of when employees asked if one lever was executive compensation and they were told no? I don't know. Something isn't adding up here and I'm suspicious, but I'm too dumb to work out what it is. I just feel like they're lying. Can I say that? I don't know if they can lie legally about that though. So let's cut this. I guess there's a chance the CEO is so humble that he didn't think to mention that they'd already forfeited some bonuses. But how is the opening dialogue not, we did everything we could to avoid these layoffs, including a bunch of executives giving up their bonuses. This was a last resort cost-cutting measure. It feels like it was mentioned more of as an afterthought, post all the negative press as a way to put out some fires. Again, my PP is small on this. Look, hiring an employee can't be a forever promise. And firing is a natural part of a business's life cycle. A company can't just grow forever. As revenue fluctuates, a company has to expand and contract accordingly. But if you're in charge and make a gamble that doesn't pay off, to what degree should you take responsibility for the consequences? Also, as an employee, God, it's got to feel so unjust to be punished for a mistake that you didn't make. Bungie had also recently completed work on a brand new headquarters, more than double the size of its previous office in Bellevue, Washington. Sure, that work was drafted and paid for long before the layoffs. But there's no denying the building was another expensive bet by upper management. If you spend money in a certain area, you don't have that money for a different area. And speaking of spending money, the president of Sony flew to Seattle and said this very interesting thing afterwards. Quote, I visited the Bungie Studios and had meetings with management and I saw that employees working at the studios were highly motivated, showing great creativity as well as an impressive knowledge of live services. So basically, I met with everyone, the managers and the employees. Loved the employees. Zero criticism there. But he goes on. I also felt that there was room for improvement from a business perspective with regard to areas such as the use of business expenses and assuming accountability for development timelines. Business expenses, you say? Who's in charge of that? Upper management. So translated from corporate speech, he's saying the way the people in charge of money are spending that money isn't good, actually. But here's where it gets interesting. The development timelines. He doesn't say there's room for improvement with the development timelines. He says there's room for improvement with assuming accountability for the development timelines. And this is coming from Sony's official translation of the call. I might be overthinking this, but that reads to me like a comment on the character of upper management. Otherwise, why would he use the word accountability? If he was just saying the content production is too slow, surely he would have just said that, but he doesn't. Obviously, I'm wildly speculating here, but it sounds like he spoke to management and said, what, what's, what's with the development timelines? And if they just blamed external factors and took no accountability for poor leadership, his statement afterwards makes perfect sense. And if there's one thing we know about upper management, it's that their leadership is questionable at best. I think the Sony president immediately recognized the employees are awesome, but the executives, not so sure. Let's talk about the previous game director Joe Blackburn leaving Bungie because the topic of this video is the end of Destiny and that moment felt extremely significant. I've been furiously stalking the timeline of Joe's career while researching and here's what I've come up with. In 2014, he joins Bungie as a raid designer right before the first Crota's end. He's in that team for about four years and at some point becomes the leader of that team. In October 2018, he's promoted from raid design lead to design lead. I guess a, a much broader role and probably in charge of more people. Six months later in April 2019, he leaves Bungie for Riot for 10 months. Then in June 2020, he returns as assistant game director. Riders Beyond Light is about halfway through development. Six months later, in November 2020, Beyond Light comes out and Joe's now game director, taking the reins from Luke Smith. That's interesting because I think Luke Smith called him and said, come back to Bungie as assistant game director. I'll train you for six months. And then when Beyond Light ships, you can take over for me as game director. On the FPS podcast a few years later, you know what Joe says as to why he came back to Bungie? Quote, the opportunity to come back to Bungie and have a big shape in the future of the game was just really exciting. My translation? To finally have enough power and influence to actually make the game good. Obviously they offered him more money as well, but he can't just say that on a podcast. And what do you know, 15 months later in February 2022, The Witch Queen comes out. Arguably the best expansion in Destiny 2 history. The first expansion Joe was fully in charge of. Five months later in July 2022, Sony acquires Bungie. We'll come back to that. Seven months later, so we're now in February 2023, that's one year on from Witch Queen. Lightfall comes out, big oopsie. And finally, another year later in February 2024, it was supposed to be the release of Final Shape and that's when Joe leaves. Final Shape had been delayed at this point, but it was supposed to be out by then. So in total, he was game director for just over three years. Really not a long time. Considering it probably took Luke Smith six months to teach Joe to be game director, Blackburn probably did the same for Tyson Green. So that means in the six months immediately after Lightfall's release, Joe decided he wanted to step down as game director and started training Tyson. 
Tyson. So what happened in those months that caused Joe to walk away from the job of a lifetime? Well, Lightfall had bombed, so we had the biggest player population drop off in history. It was eight months after Lightfall that the dreaded we missed revenue projections by 45% meeting happened. But Joe would have probably already seen that as game director, so that figure wouldn't have surprised him. He potentially knew that mass layoffs were on the horizon and did everything he could internally to avoid them. The reason I say that is because Joe quit one year and seven months post Sony acquisition. And as game director, he absolutely would have been part of Sony's $1.2 billion employee retention scheme. Basically, Sony set money aside to keep Bungie employees from quitting after the acquisition. And 66% of the $1.2 billion were for the first two years of retention incentive, according to Sony's Q3 21 earnings report. So it was probably a two to five year deal structure. And for Joe to walk away in under two years post acquisition means he probably left some sizable bonuses on the table. So clearly money isn't everything here. Another thing to know about Joe is that he's a Destiny super fan. When he left for Riot, he was still playing heaps of Destiny in his spare time. As game director, after every release, he blocks out a full week in his calendar to just play the game. He takes all meetings while playing the game. No wonder he's so beloved by players and devs. That's our boy right there. So for him to walk away from Bungie when he's mostly in charge of the thing he loves, it's not because he's sick of Destiny. I wonder if he got a better sense of how difficult working with upper management was going to be and was like, actually, I hate this. Or he saw Destiny's future over the next few years and didn't like where it's going. Remember, we potentially don't have any major expansions in the pipe. They've announced a few episodes, but that might be less than a season's worth of content each time. Destiny's potentially going on life support for the foreseeable future post Final Shape. That might have scared Joe. Or it's none of those reasons and he just got an insane offer from another company that was impossible to say no to. But gun to my head, if I had to guess, it's probably a mixture of all of the above. Life is very complex when you're an adult. All that to say, Joe leaving is definitely a bad sign, ooh woo. So where do we go from here? Well, the final thing I want to touch on is Onslaught. And full disclosure, all these ideas came from a conversation I had with Dado. He is much smarter than me but I'm more toxic, so we're a good team. The only way I know how to say it is that we've already passed peak destiny. Think about your favorite seasonal activity we've ever had. It's either the coil from Season of the Wish or Menagerie from Season of Opulence. That was it. We'll never get something better than that again. Think about your favorite dungeon. Mine's Warlord Ruin. That was it. We'll never get a better dungeon than that. Think about your favorite raid. Mine's probably Scourge of the Past. We'll never get a better raid than that. And for any of these, even if we do, it will be an outlier because the destiny journey is coming to an end. But how is this related to Onslaught? Well, players have been asking for a horde mode since Destiny 1 and Prison of Elders absolutely does not count. But after all these years, this is what we get. Something that looks good at best, nothing truly special, nothing truly innovative, basically the same four mechanics we've seen a million times and aliens walking in a straight line toward us. Don't get me wrong, I'm gonna play this and grind my face off for a god roll Luna's Howl. Cough when it's no longer time gated, cough. But what I'm saying is peak Destiny is in the past. This is as good as the game can ever get. They have to design almost everything for the lowest common denominator. Basically the player who can't even make a build. I don't know if you've noticed but almost everything in the end game is easy with a build and almost impossible without one. For example, I did a Grandmaster Nightfall video with Dado and Danielle, forcing us to use only legendary gear, no exotics, essentially no build. And even Dado couldn't believe how hard it was. He was complaining the whole time. Therefore, every activity short of the end game definitely can't require people to use a build. So we're back to the lowest common denominator. Not to mention the handcuffs that the unrelenting speed of live service game development puts on devs. And even if Onslaught was a banger 10 out of 10 activity, which I'm very skeptical it is, upper management can't help but piss and throw up all over it by time gating the rewards for six weeks. If you only truly cared about one of the new weapons coming out, you might have been waiting a month and a half to get it. I've never lost an erection faster. Thankfully, they immediately backpedaled this after community outrage. It's interesting that the developers of the Into the Light live streams didn't say a word about the time gating until the blog post way after the fact. This screams to me they at least knew people would hate it and maybe also hated it themselves. Who do we know that cares about money and their for player retention more than anything. Our old pals in Upper Madge. The fact that they rolled the dice on this brain dead time gating and only made it tolerable after significant backlash tells me the poor decision making of executives is alive and well. They couldn't just announce Onslaught and have it be as big a win as possible to maximize goodwill and player sentiment. We couldn't get a something went right for once headline. Of course not. Nice one people in charge of everything. You've done it again. I'll conclude with this. What are the chances the Final Shapes new patrol zone, new campaign, new season seasonal activity, new dungeon, new raid, new sandbox, and new exotics are all the best in Destiny history. Not great. And therefore, we've probably already seen the best the game will ever be. And for that reason, we may very much be at the end of Destiny. Subscribe to my channel though, I'll still be here.